It's a button. See them in the casket, touch them. It's really important to them. I'm getting ready to long body right now. It's kind of a thrill for me. I, I, I kind of get kind of like, oh yeah, I'm going to embalm somebody now. That's kind of weird, but I really love doing what I do. Okay. I kind of compare this to my husband's line of work, who is a tattoo artist, and the human body becomes a canvas for my particular art. Now we can prepare for embalming. Mix my fluid in my tank. This particular fluid has a lanolin base, gives a nice texture and coloration to the tissue. The main artery used in embalming is the right common carotid. Now I'm going to open the artery and proceed to inject. I've seen one embalming done. It's a mental picture that I don't need to get too often. You know, like... Okay, so from this clip you guys can see that um, my topic today is I'm going to reveal some interesting facts about mortuary science and the embalming process of a body. Um, but first I want to start off with a mortuary um, joke. It's one of my favorite jokes in the whole world, I think it's hilarious, but we'll see. Um, I got it from jokesaboutfunerals.com, and it's called The Taxi. And a passenger in a taxi leans over to the driver and taps him on the shoulder. And the driver screamed, lost control of the cab, Almost runs into a bus, drives over a curb, and stops right before he hits a uh, large plate of glass. A few moments go by, and uh, the uh, passenger kind of shaken up says, oh my gosh, I didn't know tapping on someone's shoulder would actually freak them out that much. And the uh, driver said, no, 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 I'm sorry. It's entirely my fault. Today's my first drive. For my first day as a driving a cab, um, I'm used to driving a uh, Hearst. Hearst, thank you. <laughs> it's really bad to Larry. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Anyways, he's used to driving a hearse. So that's my joke. <laughs> so um, there are many different things about mortuary science I'd like that I can go on and on about, but I'm actually just going to go over the process of embalming. Now, there's five stages of the embalming process, and the first stage is called pre embalming. Now, um, the really bad thing about being a mortician is that People die at the most random times, especially around holidays, because people like to get drunk and go driving and they crash and some of them die. So you're actually going out in like 1 a.m. in the morning, 2 a.m. in the morning, 3 a.m. in the morning to go get a body because basically you have to get the body before uh, rigor mortis starts to hit and yeah, it starts to decompose. So that's the first stage. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that saying, um, you're a basket case. Okay, well, mortuary science actually adopted that um, saying. It's because back in the day, I don't know how far back in the day, but we never, they didn't have body bags. So basically, they had these wicker caskets, and they would go into the, the house and take the body, put it in this wicker um, casket, and take it out of the house so that, you know, the public couldn't see what happened to the body, if it was shot or whatever. So that's where uh, your basket case comes from. <laughs> Uh, the second stage is uh, the feature setting. Now this is the position of the body, the exact way you would want to see the body for the last time before the embalming happens. So um, this is what you basically saw up there where they um, put the, they get the artery and wait, where is that stage yet? Yeah, this is basically where they do the formaldehyde. And um, it all depends on if you want like uh, an open or a closed casket. Uh, I'm not going to go into great detail the positioning, but um, I'll actually explain one uh, cool fact about how they close the mouth. Okay, the mouth is closed either by uh, tying wait by tying the jaw together with a piece of suture string or by a special injecting gun. With the su with the suture method, a curved needle with a piece of suture string is threaded through the jaw below the gum, stuck through upper jaw into the right nostril, threaded through the septum of the nose into the left nostril, and then passed back into the mouth. The two ends are sutured and tied, carefully not too tightly, so that a natural appearance of the mouth is created. Okay. Uh, third step is um, arterial embalming. Uh, the arterial um, embalming is become, yeah, Sorry, 
I went a little too fast. The arterial embalming is the actual embalming process. <laughs> it's when um, you put the two gallons or so you mixture of formaldehyde and other chemicals in the water in case of a certain cancer or diabetic conditions because of drugs used prior to death where body deterioration has already begun, a stronger or waterless solution is likely to be used. Now, one really cool fact that I found out about this is that you have to have different colors of embalming fluid. As you saw up there, there was a pink color. That's for like people that don't have like a disease like jaundice. If you have a disease like jaundice, your skin's yellow. So basically, you have to use like a different color in order for the body not to turn completely green because nobody wants to see a zombie effect in their cast. <laughs> uh, the fourth stage what, uh, is the cavity embalming. Now, this is the gross part. <laughs> this is actually where um, your inside organs, such as um, urine and bile, begins to decompose, and gases and bacteria build up, causing uh, distillation, odor, and purge. Basically, you have to take, you have to flush out the intestines and everything, and um, you have to get an autopsy before that happens. And after the autopsy, to, to determine the death, they put it back into the body so that we actually have to take it back out, put it in a bag, put it in a chemical, <laughs> and sometimes you put it back into the body or it gets to sit at the very end of the casket. It depends on what you really want. Um, what I found out really, uh, there was a, a lawsuit the other week about um, a mortuary, uh, basically what happened was that this lady, um, her husband died, and there's these uh, ropes that you put underneath the casket to lower it into the grounds. Well, one of those ropes broke, and the casket flew open, and the guy's head rolled out. <laughs> so can you imagine, like, your husband or wife, if that happened to you at your funeral, like, you'd be, like, devastated. But what happened was is that the guy didn't fit into the casket. So they chopped his neck off. <laughs> now that's awful because a nor like any smart mortician would have cut off the legs if it didn't fit in the casket, or they would have said, "Hey, here's a bigger casket. <laughs> you can buy it for this much." <laughs> but yeah, so she actually won the lawsuit, and I just thought that was really awful. But okay. So last stage is the final bombing stage. Okay, and basically what this is is your last time you get to see the person. So this is the process of you washing the body, putting makeup on it, making them look pretty, all that fun stuff. That's the actual fun part of embalming. And so, um, now that I have revealed some interesting facts of mortuary science in the process of embalming, I hope that you guys can see that it's not just work, it's a piece of art. I guess I got my cards mixed up. So Daniel, what did you think? Yeah, I think she had a good attention driver with the video. And the claim was interesting and she has really good examples of the bombing steps and interesting and an interesting story about the coffin headless. Maybe one thing she could probably fix is to look up more at the audience and some more slides, but I like it. No, no, no complaints. Thanks, Daniel. Be careful, she's a dangerous woman. All right, uh, I think you need to introduce the video before you present it as your attention device. I think uh, it's always a little bit awkward when you start off with the video. People aren't sure, is the speech starting? Are you still testing things? Uh, which, what am I supposed to be paying attention to? If you get it set up, you and all you need is a simple statement that <coughs> it says something like, uh, you know, there, here, here's this interesting interview that I think I'd uh, like to share with you as a lead-in to the subject that we're going to be talking about. Something, uh, a simple sentence so that we know that you are, in fact, actually starting. Uh, then later on, you have a second attention device. You got the joke that you need to practice. I know. <laughs> I was nervous. Because <laughs> you had a hard time with the punchline there. <laughs> you know, uh, so that's a little bit awkward. I, I did think Sorry. that the I did think that the thesis was very clear. That part was good. 
Uh, the preview, this is a little problematic because at first it sounded like it was going to be random information, but then as you got into it, it appears you are going to talk about those different stages that you mentioned. I think you should tell us what the stages are at the beginning. That would be a more complete preview. You just mentioned that you're going to talk about the stages. I don't know what they are, and, and I think that's a little bit awkward. You do tell us how many there were. By the way, that seems like it would be an obvious um, additional visual aid that you could put on a slide, a list of the individual steps uh -huh. that you were talking about in that process and maybe highlight a couple of things that go on at each of those points, even, I don't know, maybe even illustrating with a, a photograph or something along those lines. As it is, it ends up that all of your visual material is just that video clip at the beginning, which was interesting, but which, you know, like I said, you're using mostly as an attention device. We have to refer back to some things, and that works occasionally, but imagine, for instance, how much easier it would have been if you were referring to the process of inserting the embalming fluid and you could just show us that section of the video where she is uh, getting the pink embalming fluid ready and ready to insert it into the carotid artery 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 <laughs> see the Heidi earthquake the, 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 ar the artery yeah. um, I do think you need to cite your sources a little bit more. I'm sure that you got the information. I mean, you cited the joke. Yeah, <laughs> that was interesting. I'm sorry. You, gave me, you gave me the source citation on the joke, but I didn't get source citations on a lot of it's the other right stuff, and that there. that was a little bit awkward. Um, like I said, I, I could tell what the points were, but I, you got a little lost a couple times. I yeah. think you know that yourself. Um, it was relatively clear where you were as you went along because. You did move from point, you did talk about the stages, but they need to be smoother as you're going from point to point. Um, on the delivery, I think uh, Daniel already mentioned, you probably need to read a little bit less, talk more to us. One of the things that you'll notice when you listen back is that you have a tendency to drop your voice whenever there's uncertainty. Your voice drops out a little bit and you lower, and a lot of people do that. Sometimes you do that, sometimes people do that intentionally. You're trying to draw attention to something, so it's like, I'm talking about this, don't worry because it's really important. You know, so you change, so you change the volume of your voice to pull people in. But you, it seems like it's just I'm just doing it randomly, or it's as a transition thing, or I'm I'm done with this particular point, and I'm going to move on to this. And now the next thing we're talking about, and I'm, uh, so it's, it's just kind of running out of steam, and you don't want that to be the impression that you leave. All right, thank you.